this lecture, we have seen that there is high inequality both within and across countries. And we will even see more of more statistics that show that. And we also know that in recessions, inequality in incomes may actually be exacerbated. Ireland was a prime example for that, where the inequality in market incomes went up the most among all OECD countries during the financial crisis that started in 2008. But we've also seen that the Irish welfare state actually does a very good job in reducing income inequality and in cautioning people's incomes from these shocks. That does not mean that, that uh, no shock can ever harm uh, the incomes of, of people in Ireland, but at least uh, the Irish welfare state cautions people from people's lives and people's livelihood from these adverse economic shocks. So the question is, well, how do governments actually do that? Right? So how can they use a welfare state as what's called an automatic stabilizer, whereby during a, a recession, more people become unemployed and then they, they receive things like unemployment benefits and, and other types of social benefits that keep their income at a certain level. So how can a government, by collecting taxes and redistributing the, the tax revenue, spending and, and providing transfers, how can a government provide insurance against shocks? How can it use the tools of redistribution? It has to do that. That's what we're going to talk about in the remainder of lecture five. But before we do that, I want to just show you a few more interesting statistics about inequality. Um, here is one from um, Raj Chetty's um, Opportunity Insight uh, page, which I also I've, I've linked at a previous slide and I can highly recommend having a look at it. They do a lot of work on the inequality of opportunity in the United States. So their goal is to take new big administrative data sets uh, at, in order to really understand you know, what inequality of opportunity do we have. And here you can see um, that, the, so, so what they did, for example, is they calculated the life expectancy for every county and then even at a lower level for every zip code in the United States. And here you can see uh, the neighborhoods in the city of Baltimore. Um, so, so, you know, these are, these are small neighborhoods and you can see a huge difference in life expectancy. And Baltimore is known to be a city that, that has, you know, that faces quite some social challenges to, to put it mildly. Um, but even within that city, you can see huge differences in life expectancy. And so in, in, in those areas that are, uh, that are dark orange or red, the life expectancy is below 70 years. And in other areas, so, so, so you see here, um, Santan Winchester, 67, whereas in other places, such as Roland Park up here, it's 84 years. So within the same city, you, you have huge discrepancies depending on the neighborhood, right? And, and so it, it's obviously, there must be something about those neighborhoods and the people who live there that make them very, very different. And the, the question that, that a lot of social scientists are after now is, to what extent is it just that people who, you know, are in poor health and, and, and are, you know, don't have the greatest opportunities move into certain neighborhoods. And so then that discrepancy is just the, the, the result of this, this differential moving process. You know, if, if you don't have a high earnings potential, you move to a neighborhood that's cheap. And then when you measure the life expectancy in areas, well, yeah, no surprise that the people there um, have a low life expectancy because all the, the not so healthy people select into that neighborhood. 
But could it also be that it's something about growing up in such a neighborhood that influences you that could be changed by government? And that's what, what Raj Chetty and his team and, and many others are, are currently after to really understand to what extent can governments intervene here to change things like that, to, to change this, these dark discrepancies in equality of opportunity. So here is the here are a few more numbers um, that's taken from from Gruber's textbook. Admittedly, already uh, quite a few years old, but but nonetheless, I mean, you you would see similar patterns uh, patterns now, which again shows you just the the income distribution, the the income inequality, how it differs across countries. Um, and uh, you, you can see here that when you look at the top ten percent, um, then in countries such as Sweden and Austria, it's actually very, very, uh, very low. So income is a lot less concentrated than in a country such as the US or, or, or Mexico. And so, so there is there is inequality in every country, but uh, the, um, the degree of inequality differs dramatically, right? So also when you look at here, um, for example, a top 40% in, in each of those countries, so in Sweden, they, they get, uh, bit less than 60% of all incomes. In the US, it's, it's 68%, and in Mexico, even more, it's, it's almost 74 Um. Now, one may ask, well, what's the problem with inequality? Why do we care about this? And uh, the, the reason, that there are a few reasons. So first of all, most societies appear to have an aversion against inequality. Now, that doesn't mean that most people will tell you, I want an inequality of zero, I want absolute equality, but they do not tolerate extremely high inequality. And especially in, in, in cases where you don't have equality of opportunity, where life ch the chances of doing well in life are heavily dependent on, on things that are beyond your control, um, it, then obviously inequality is something that that need the root causes of that inequality is something that that lots of people would agree should be addressed. Um, and there there are also lots of consequences of inequality that that we are you know social scientists are trying to understand. But but you know we've come a long way. But there is a lot of interesting questions here uh, yet to be to be asked and answered. Right. So so if, for example. Um, if you have great inequality in a society, um, you know, Western societies, do, like most democracies are based, are built on social cohesion. It's, you know, we, we have a common goal as, as a nation living in this, in this state and, and, and we have something like a, a, a social contract that, that we look out for each other and have a common goal. Um, but that social cohesion may be eroded if you have some people who do extremely well and others who don't. And especially then if, if the people who do extremely well attribute that to their higher effort they put in rather than to developments that were completely beyond uh, their, their own control. That can be a huge problem for social cohesion and can have all sorts of political and social problems. So there is an active research agenda trying to look into to what extent um, there is an erosion in social cohesion due to automation, due to trade integration, where you know lots of manufacturing workers in the U.S. lost their jobs, and and um, you know it does that explain the the rise of, of 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 Donald Trump, and does that explain also the rise of populist parties in many European countries? Okay, so so you have. You know, political problems. Um, it can also affect people's well-being. Um, you know, if 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 people uh, see that they themselves and their families have no progress in their income, others are progressing, but they themselves are not. That may may affect their well-being, their mental health, and so on, and, and can have huge societal cost. So there are many reasons why high inequality is is a problem. And, and I believe there are few people who would dispute that. Where the dispute comes, the political dispute is then more, what is an acceptable level of inequality? 
So what, how much inequality is one willing to tolerate? And uh, you can look at survey data, for example, in the World Value Survey, they ask these type of questions and you see wildly different answers across people. And so the instruments that, uh, that governments use to address those inequalities are taxation and transfers. And so we will talk about both of them, at least, you know, scratch the surface of what type of transfers there are and, 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 and what some of the incentive problems are when a government gives those transfers. Do those transfers actually target the right people? And, and do they have maybe some side effects that are unintended consequences that, that, that make them less effective? So, what welfare programs are there that, that a government can, can use uh, in, in terms of transfer? Um, there are two big types of, of uh, welfare programs. One are categorical welfare programs and the other means-tested welfare. In most countries, you will find both. So categorical welfare programs target a certain group and oftentimes it's very well defined who gets that transfer and who doesn't. Right? So the, the, the best example here are child benefits. In Ireland and in lots of other countries, everyone who has a child gets a child benefit. But, and and it's, it's, it's very clear from birth records and, and so on to see you know, who is a parent and who isn't. Um, there are other things are disability benefits. So if you can prove that you have a disability, you may be eligible for disability benefits. With a disability, it's obviously less, less clear cut than with whether a person has a child or not, um, who is eligible and who is not, but, but it's still, it's, it's a, categorical, um, uh, a categorical welfare program, um, you know, where it's also not so easy to, to, to you know, if, if you don't have a disability to pretend to do so, because you need to, to, to prove it. Now, there are other welfare programs that, that you see a lot, for example, unemployment benefits or childcare subsidies or social housing that are means tested, which means only people whose income or assets or, or, or other measures are that, that, that are the measures of their living standard fall below a certain threshold are eligible for that. Right, so, so unemployment benefits uh, is, is a prime example or childcare subsidies in Ireland, if you're very poor, you get, or if you have a very low income, you get child subsidies, but if you have kind of a medium, inter, an intermediate income, you don't. Um, and so means-tested programs are often the best a government can do, but as we will see, they come with all sorts of incentive problems because to some extent, how much people earn or can earn depends on themselves. And so, so for obviously for, for many people, it is very beneficial to just work because if they were unemployed, their income would go down a lot because the unemployment benefits are not that generous. But for people with a low earnings potential to begin with, it might actually be economically more beneficial to not work or to not work as much and rather get unemployment or other types of social benefits. And I'm not saying this here as a value judgment. So don't get me wrong here. I'm just saying that there is this incentive to, for, for, for certain groups of the population, those with a low earnings potential, um, where simply going to work doesn't pay off that much in monetary terms. Right? And so, so this, this is one of the challenges uh, that we will see with means-tested welfare programs. Is there a perfect welfare program that works always and for everyone and, and, and fulfills exactly the, the target that, that it should have? No. But at the same time, having those, me those welfare programs is, is, in my view, absolutely necessary um, no state could function, no society could function easily without them. So the question is more just, you know, how, how can we 
make them better or how can we make them functioning well they don't need to be perfect right so we always have to live with 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 unintended consequences and side effects 